This lecture deals with univariate statistics, the most basic type of statistical analysis. It involves looking at the characteristics of a data set using one variable at a time. Topics include data sets, code books, frequency distributions, proportions, percentages, and cumulative distributions. Information used in statistical analysis begins as a data set. A data set is a collection of variables with information about some unit of interest, for example, people, organizations, or something else that we're interested in studying. Data sets are usually organized into a series of rows and columns. Rows contain information on individual records, while columns contain the values of variables across individual records. The intersection of rows and columns is called a cell, and contains a numerical code corresponding to a value of a variable for a given individual. For this lecture, I'm going to be using examples from the General Social Survey, or, G or the GSS, collected in, in 2012. The GSS is an ongoing data collection effort organized by the National Opinion Research Center, NORC, at the University of Chicago. NORC has been collecting the GSS data approximately every other year since 1972. The GSS represents a major source of information on the attitudes, behaviors, and attributes of the U.S. population. It's nationally representative of adults, that is, people age 18 or over, who are English-speaking and who are non-institutionalized, that is, people who aren't living in a nursing home or an insane asylum or a prison or something like that. Here's an example of a simple data set. Notice that it has 15 rows or records and 9 columns or variables. The different rows show responses for different individuals that were compiled for this data set. And for each of these rows, they have values on the different variables. So for example, if we look at the first row for person 1, we see that that person has some variable educ. Educ is a measure of education. Notice that it's code, coded 16 for this person, which indicates that this person has 16 years of education. As another example, look at the variable class. This is a numerical code of 4. Now it may not be obvious what 4 means in the context of the variable class. So we have to look at something that maps the raw code in this data set to the actual meaning of these values in plain English. And that thing is something called a codebook. So a codebook is a mapping of the raw codes in, in the data set to their actual meaning in plain English. Let's look at the codebook entry for class, which measures the subjective social class of the respondent. Respondents were asked this literal question to generate the data. If you were asked to use one of four names for your social class, which would you say you belong in? The lower class, the working class, the middle class, or the upper class? And each of these different classes was coded using a distinct numerical coding. For example, lower class people were coded using the value 1. All of the other class values also had distinct numbers. Working class people were coded as 2. Middle class people received a value of 3. 4 was used to code upper class people. And then people who indicated having no class were coded as 5. Notice that there are also codes for other answers that are set off numerically from the rest of the data. These are, in, these are used to indicate that these values aren't supposed to be used in statistical analysis. So for example, some people were not asked this question, in which case they were coded as zero, non-applicable. Other people didn't know the answer to this question, and so they indicated that they didn't know and were coded with a value of eight. Some people left this blank, in which case they were coded nine for no answer. Now that we know how to categorize variables according to variable categories, we can create something called frequencies. And we can organize these into something called a frequency distribution. A frequency distribution is the most basic method of classifying observations, and it's usually the first step in statistical analysis. A frequency distribution is constructed by counting and recording the number of cases in each variable category. And these frequency distributions are usually organized into tables. Doing so allows us to see many patterns in the data. For example, we can see the high and low category to get a sense of the span of the data. Or we can see there's, whether there's any clustering on certain categories. In order for the information in the table to be easily readable by an audience, we have to consider the tables contain, contain certain essential features or elements. Uh, these include a descriptive title, a total number of cases, and a data source. I'll consider each of these in turn, using the example of a frequency distribution of class. So here's the table showing the distribution of class. Notice that it has basically two columns, 
One, showing the different categories of class, like lower class, working class, middle class, and upper class. And then the second, showing the frequency for each of, of these different classes. The first essential feature of the table is its title. A title is, is an important piece of information because it, it tells the reader, or whoever's looking at the table, what statistic is being used, in this case the frequency distribution, and the variable for which the statistic is being calculated, in this case subjective social class identification. A table also includes a total number of cases. Uh, here we see that this table has 1,957 cases. You might be wondering, why do we include a total number of cases? Well, it's an important piece of information to judge the quality of the information being presented in the table. You may have heard things like, 4 out of 5 dentists prefer Crest. Well, does it matter if we ask 5 dentists or 500 dentists about whether they prefer Crest? Of course it does. So, indicating the number of cases used gives the audience a better sense of the quality of the information being presented in the table. Tables also include a source. Here I've indicated that the source of this, da this data is the General Social Survey 2012. Now you might be wondering why, why would, we, would we include information on, on the source? Again, this is another piece of important information used to judge the quality of the data. Ask yourself this, would you trust the Philip Morris Corporation as much as the World Health Organization for information about lung cancer? Probably not. And so if you're presenting data from one of, the, of these organizations or another, people would want to know where the data are coming from in order to judge the quality. Likewise, we indicate the source of the data in this table as well. Now let's actually turn to looking at the different frequencies for each of the different categories. Let's start with the, the lowest category, lower class. We see that the frequency for this category is 200. Well, what does that mean? Well, that indicates that 200 respondents identify as being lower class. We can also look at tables and identify larger patterns. What if we wanted to know the general pattern of, of this distribution? Well, we can see that most people consider themselves to be in the middle. In particular, we see that 853 people consider themselves being working class, while 839 people consider themselves to be in the middle class. Once we've created a frequency distribution, we can easily create something called proportions and percentages, which are basically a standard, standardized form of a frequency. Frequencies uh, can be turned into proportions by dividing each of them by the total number of cases. Typically, when we're presenting statistics, uh, we show a formula for how we calculate the statistic. Think of it as sort of a short way of describing how a statistic is calculated. Here's the formula for a proportion. I'm using P to denote the proportion, which is equal to the frequency, F, divided by N, the total number of cases. Now, N is a common convention in statistics and is usually used to refer to the total number of cases, so you'll see this often. From proportions, we can actually calculate percentages. To calculate a percentage from a proportion, we take the proportion, P, and multiply it by 100. Alternatively, we can take the frequency, divide it by the total number of cases, and then multiply it by 100. And that will also give us a percentage. Once we've created percentages, we can display these in a distribution. A frequency distribution shows the percentage of observations falling into each category of the variable. Think of it like having a data set of 100 cases. The percentage distribution basically shows you how many of the 100 cases fall into each category of the variable. Let's look at a percentage distribution for social class. The next slide shows how to take a frequency distribution and turn it into a percent distribution. And each of these different percentages is calculated by dividing the respective frequency by the total number of cases and multiplying it by 100. So, Recall that 200 people were in the lower class. Suppose that we wanted to calculate the percentage of people in the lower class. Well, we would just take that 200, divide it by the total number of cases, in this case 1,957, and we multiply that value by 100, and that gives us 10.22. How do we interpret that? Well, we can say that about 10% of people are in the lower class, and likewise we can interpret all the other categories in the same way. Once we've created percentages and frequencies, we can create cumulative distributions. Cumulative distributions show us the relative position of a given score in a distribution, that is, the proportion of the distribution at or below a given score. And we can use either percentages or frequencies in the form of cumulative distributions. However, 
Because cumulative dis distributions indicate the relative rank of a category, they're only appropriate for variables measured on an ordinal level of measurement or higher. In other words, they're not appropriate for nominal variables, because those variables have no ranking. So, to construct a cumulative distribution, we start by carrying over the value of the first category, and then keeping a running total by adding the value of the, of the next category. We continue this until we run out of categories. In the following example, we're going to look at a cumulative frequency distribution for the variable age, which is here shown as a series of categories. So here's the table of the frequency distribution for age. Notice that age is broken down into several categories, 18 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, and so on. If we wanted to take each of the frequencies of age and represent them as a cumulative frequency distribution, here's how we do it. First, we carry over the frequency of the, of the lowest category, in this case, age 18 to 29. Notice that there's 331 cases that are age 18 to 29, so we just carry that over. To get the cumulative frequency for those who are 30 to 39, we'll just add that 331 to the frequency of the next highest category, which has 389 cases. And then 331 plus 389 gives us 720. At this point, if we wanted to interpret the, that value, we would say that 720 people are 39 years of age or younger. What if we wanted to get the, the cumulative frequency of the next highest age category, 40 to 49? Well, we would just add 720 to the frequency of that category, and that gives us a value of 357. So 720 plus 357 gives us 1,077, and that tells us how many people are age 49 or younger. We basically continue this pattern until we run out of categories. Notice that by the time we reach the last category, 80 plus, the cumulative frequency should equal the total number of cases. We can also calculate a cumulative percent distribution using this, basically the same procedure. The next slides show how to calculate a cumulative percent distribution for the variable age. So, starting with the lowest category, 18 to 29, we see that 16.81% of people are in that category. So we just carry that over. To get the, the cumulative percent of the next highest category, 30 to 39, we're just going to add that percent to the percent of the next highest category. When we add 16.81 and 19.76, we get a value of 36.57. To get the cumulative percent of the next highest category, 40 to 49, we just add in their percentage, 18.13. So 18.13 plus 36.59 gives us 54.7. We can interpret that by saying about 55% of the distribution is age 49 or younger. To get the remaining cumulative percent columns, we just continue using the same pattern. And we do so until we reach the highest category, 80 plus. And when we're finished, we should notice that the cumulative percent of the highest category should add, should add up to the percent total of that category.